Um, well, thank you very much. Thank you all for organizing this and for inviting me. Um, my name is Colleen Hamlin. I am a professor at Wake Forest School of Medicine. As um, some of you may know already, as of this week, I accepted a position as Vice President of Medical Affairs um, at Brainsway. Um, one of the other things that for this call is probably most important about that role is I'll also be heading the innovation team, which is essentially the research lab within Brainsway. Um, and so I'll, I'll remain super interested in this field. Um, but what I'm going to talk to you about today is, um, is what we've done in non-human primate TMS. It's always very intimidating to follow the previous speakers because they're such technical engineers, and I'm just a biologist. Um, but um, for the title of my talk, I, um, I've done TMS for a long time, and um, Databurst kind of came on the scene, and everyone was like, ooh, well, it, it must work, and that paper from Kwong et al. has been cited now, you know, thousands of times, but after it um, sort of caught on, and now it's been used clinically, um, more and more research came out, and it was hard to replicate the initial protocol. And so it was the case that, as many of you perhaps on this call have tried, um, it's not always the case in a typical human that comes into a lab when you give the sort of standard protocol of ITBS that's been published a lot that you get predictable facilitation. And we did a study in our lab a few years ago where we um, really explored this in depth. It was read, um, led by Dan McCallie et al., published maybe two years ago. and. Um, and we found that in just humans out in the wild coming into the lab, um, it was very hard to replicate um, the facilitation effects of TMS. And so, um, of course, there's been a lot of talk about why that is. And as Dr. Lisenby mentioned earlier and Dr. Froelich mentioned in his talk, brain state obviously has a lot of impact on um, or interacts with the ability of TMS and various protocols to manipulate the brain. And humans have like crazy brains. And that's why there's been a big push towards trying to control the brain state in human clinical trials, perhaps with a Q. Um, it's now integrated into the FDA label for OCD um, and smoking that you have to kind of put them in sort of a state when this is, in this case, it's sort of Q reactivity. So, um, I went to Wake Forest and they have a really active non-human primate research program and they have for decades. And the non-human primate model enables us to um, really kind of control a lot of experimental um, parameters. Um, in our case, we had most of the data I'm going to show you here is from a cohort of 12 animals. They were male cinemologous monkeys. They're kind of about the size of like a one-year-old child, maybe a skinny one-year-old child. Um, and this is an image of their brains. We, um, so we have 12 animals. That's actually a really big sample size for a non-human primate study. Um, and we've kind of looked at them intermittently over time for about 18 months now. Um, this is just an image of their brain. Those of you on the call, probably particularly like Alex Opitz and other people that are invested in e-field modeling, um, look at this and they're like, oh my gosh, the distance from the outside of the brain, the skull to the brain itself is gigantic. Um, and it is relative to the size of the non-human primate brain. But in fact, the depth there is um, about 15 millimeters. Um, on average, depending on where you can come in, which is similar to the depth in a human from the scalp to the cortex. And so even though relative to the brain size, it's um, different, it's actually a reasonable model of scalp to cortex distance in a human. So these are the animals we're gonna use for this study. Um, the first thing we had to do, we've done um, a series of many studies, and I just have 10 minutes to talk to you. Um, but the first thing we needed to do is just first of all, to see if we could get to their little hands to move with a TMS coil. We used a variety of coils from a variety of manufacturers. Um, we ended up actually getting the best results from a standard figure of eight coil, the same you would use to take motor threshold in a human. Um, and this um, first little proof of principle study that we did was in um, female rhesus animals. So this is slightly different. Um, this is a group of female rhesus, and we calculated um, recruitment curves. And in this case, you can see we stimulated at, um, we put electrodes on the um, paws, in the, both the hand and the leg area of the animal itself. And then we pulsed using randomized 
um, dosing um, over time, five pulses for each of these intervals from 75% to 130% of the resting motor potential of each animal. So of course we found the RMT of each animal first, um, and then we sort of found a recruitment curve. And what you can kind of see here is that it's orderly. And that's the main thing to look at is to sort of it's orderly. Each animal is um, a different color on these graphs. So all the animals are orderly. Some of the animals have steeper recruitment curves than others. Um, an important point here is that all the animals were sedated. Um, when we do that, we bring them in, um, we give them ketamine to come out of the cage, um, and then we um, sedate them with isoflurane. Um, so they're not totally under, um, but, they're, but they're sedated. And the value of that is that um, their brain state is fairly controlled, right? Um, in, some, in some ways, you can see that as both a value and a weakness of, this, of the whole um, model that we're doing at Wake Forest. Um, the value is that the brain state's controlled, and so we can really look at some of these pulse parameters. The weakness is it doesn't have as much translational utility, of course, right? Because usually we don't um, give our humans isoflurane before we receive TMS. That would be uh, fascinating to see what would happen. Okay, so we've established our model. And then the next, the first question was to see how long does a single session of ITBS, um, does it in fact induce facilitation in this non-human primate model? And how long does that facilitation last? And so our experimental design, we met, um, used a recruitment curve as our dependent measure um, for a, a series of 10 minute intervals. You can kind of see it here. Um, in this particular experiment, I'll show you, I think, a picture on the next slide. Um, we use 64% of machine output. Um, the MagStim uh, machine that we were using um, could only handle this, um, this ITBS paradigm. So we were a little bit limited. It's not exactly the same sort of Huang paradigm. Um, and um, we use the same, um, the same output for every animal. We didn't remeasure the motor threshold. So basically here we use a recruitment curve as our dependent measure. We did one session of ITBS, 600 pulses, um, and then we measured a recruitment at 10 minute intervals for about an hour. Um, this is the experimental setup here. Um, you can see we use neuro navigation um, in order to sort of guide the placement. Um, all animals had an MRI scan and we co-registered the animal's head with the MRI such that we knew where the coil was stimulating. Um, We've done that on each session subsequently, so it's nice for longitudinal consistency. Um, we collect the motor evoked potential. You can see an image of the paw here with the electrodes on each side. Um, motor evoked potential um, each time we select a T, um, apply a TMS pulse, and that's all aggregated for us. Um, and the summary here is that um, of the uh, 12 animals we looked at, sort of eight of them had sort of facilitation. That would be the um, amplitude of the orange bars is the, um, is, the, is the average amplitude at 70, 75, 80, 85, 90, and 95% of machine output. And so all these animals had facilitation on the right-hand side. Um, that's their names on the top. So when the orange bars are higher, it shows ITBS induced facilitation. And then we actually have four animals on the left who the orange bars are lower than the blue bars. And so they actually had um, a decrease in motor cortex excitability um, after the TMS itself, after the ITBS session. We look to see how long it lasts. I apologize, I don't have a nice slide for you here. Um, we're hoping to publish this all together and we just didn't get our act together fast enough. But the answer is that in the first experiment, um, the ITBS lasted about 20 minutes for um, each animal. And of course there was variability, but when we measure the, the ITBS induced facilitation, it tends to degrade at about recruitment curve four for all animals. Um, so that was pretty, um, we were glad to see that. Actually, it was interesting and um, sort of consistent with a lot of things we've seen in humans. And then, okay, we said, all right, so ITBS reduces facilitation. What happens if we do multiple sessions of ITBS? Um, and so this idea of kind of an accelerated or multiple sessions per day has been around for a while. Um, in our case, we used the same experimental design. So we just had 10 minute um, blocks between each recruitment curve um, that cause each recruitment curve took about two and a half minutes. So it was about 15 minutes between each ITBS session. So again, we're doing the same ITBS, but three sessions worth. 
Um, and in this case, we um, published this in brain stimulation recently. The first ITBF session again caused fairly reliable facilitation. We've now done a third experiment and we've been able to replicate that again. So in these animals, there really is um, a reliable first ITBS um, associated um, facilitation. But then oddly, ITBS2, and notice the error bars here, this is aggregated over all 12 animals, I think. Um, the error bars are really small. And ITBS2, there was nothing. And then ITBS3 caused facilitation again, um, and it seemed to sort of um, last and grow a little bit higher. So that was interesting. Um, we were wondering what that was about. Um, is it the case that ITBS1 kind of serves as a prime for ITBS3? So it's your, you're priming the brain in the same way that we would with a behavioral activation task. Maybe ITBS1 is priming the effects of something that happens at um, ITBS3, which happens about 30 minutes later. Um, so we didn't really know, um, and certainly ITBS2 is a bit confusing. And so now we've started a third experiment um, where we're doing the same experimental design, except we're not doing ITBS2. So we're testing the hypothesis that um, ITBS2 is necessary for ITBS3 related extra hyper facilitation. Um, that's, um, we're about halfway done with that experiment. Hopefully we'll finish by the end of the month um, and I'll let you know how that turns out. Um, so that's kind of what we're doing here. This is a great team um, at Wake Forest that's working on all of this. My collaborator, Paul Zodi, is going to kind of take the lead on this program moving forward, um, but I'll still be involved. And um, I think probably most importantly for this group, we really would love the help of all the um, technical and modeling experts um, to really get great e-field models of our non-human primates. Um, we've used SimNibs a little bit, but it's not currently, in my understanding, really well tweaked to do non-human primates um, because of tissue probability maps, but the ability, if we had a technology that could do that, I think it would really help advance the field. That's all, thank you very much.